my pleasure to welcome you here to the Clark Howard Show. Our mission is to be of service to you, empower you, so you make better financial decisions in your life. And I have to tell you, I keep hearing more and more in our work here about people being scammed out of huge amounts of money, elderly, young people, and in between. And I want to share a couple of stories with you. And there's important takeaways for each and every one of us. Also in this episode, are you on track for retirement in your own life? Are you? Well, most of us as Americans, we're not. Some new data, though, some new numbers actually shocked me. I mean, shocking. So let's talk about the scamsters. Scamsters are working overtime from all over the world to rip off people all over the globe. And a lot of Americans are targeted by both by our fellow Americans and people overseas, taking advantage of them, stealing their money. And the ugly term for it today is pig butchering. Pig butchering is where the criminal is patient. The con artist is patient. And they're not looking for the instant big score. They will take months and months and months to develop a relationship with you and then gain your confidence and steal your money. Over and over again, the most successful con artists are the ones that patiently take their time to steal from you. You know, the biggest con artist of all time that we know of, Bernie Madoff, it was decades and decades that he played out the string till he stole $8 billion from people. $8 billion. So pig butcherers aren't looking for that kind of money But they're looking usually for six figures or more. Uh, There was a story in the New York Post recently about a 42-year-old divorcee who told her story to be of help to others. And she had met a guy on Tinder. And they uh, developed a relationship online. They never actually went out. But Rebecca Holloway tells her story. She's a mom of three. And truth be told, she was lonely. And she met this guy online, supposedly named Fred, who month after month after month, they continued this relationship she talks about how in her case she spoke for others but she said single women approaching middle age are so vulnerable and she said i hadn't met the right guy yet and suddenly this good looking man starts talking to you and you're excited looking back the signs were so obvious but at the time you want to believe it's real And that's why I want to, I appreciate so much that she was willing to open up about this guy who over time won her confidence, won her heart, and then stole $100,000 from her in a crypto scam. And then, of course, he vanishes. And there are many different flavors to pig butchering. Some attack the elderly, as I said earlier. Some attack young people. In this case, a middle-aged woman. The LA Times did a story about uh, elderly people losing tons of money to the pig butchers. And there are so many different ways they operate. But 
uh, they profile people who lost 80,000, somebody else who lost 75,000, one after another after another. The FBI reports that what they know of is scams attacking the elderly are up 84% in the last reported year. 84%. So this is the hot thing, is people that are sociopaths who get some kind of kick out of uh, reaching out and getting to know vulnerable people and then getting the big score, stealing a portion of their life savings or all their life savings and running off with it. Know that when there's somebody you meet virtually, you don't know who they really are. You don't know if anything they've told you is true or not. All I can tell you is my heart breaks over and over again. I was just interviewed for a TV story yesterday about somebody who got pig butchered. This is so very common that, that for law enforcement, it's almost like, yeah, cars get stolen. Yeah, pig butchers steal money from people. It's so much a thing right now. So please, if you're hearing from a family member or friend about this wonderful person they've met online who they've never seen, and they're getting deeper and deeper emotionally involved and maybe even feeling like they've fallen in love with this person they've never met. Watch for the warning signs and don't pour cold water on what their heart's feeling. But if something happens where suddenly they're telling you, hey, they got this great investment from me, something like that, that's when you got to give them stories, say, hey, I really want you, this may be completely on the up and up, please read these stories first. And all you got to do is put in whatever search engine you use, pig butchering, and you'll see hundreds, if not thousands, of stories of TV reports, news reports of all kinds to protect yourself from that person who's patient and waits and then pounces at what feels like the right moment to clean you up. Out. I would also say um, one of the other common scams that just seems like it's happening a lot. Actually, we got a call last week from one of these scam artists where they call and act like they're police, oh, and yeah. they supposedly have like your address and the, a pack. In our case, it was like a package with drugs was sent with our name on it. And the next thing would have been go buy gift cards or send a wire and read the gift card numbers off to them over the phone. And then all that money's gone. I just heard about a woman who lost $8,000 buying gift cards in that way. And it was at a big box retailer. Um, I'm sure she pulled, I don't know what kind of cards they were off of the rack and spent $8,000 and the cashier didn't even notice the thing. So nobody will ever ask you to buy gift cards or wire money that's calling you for a police you know, for something with the police or anything like that. Um, so that is another red flag. That is that a, everyone that is should a know. hot, thank you for mentioning that. That is a very hot scam right now where people impersonate police officer, sheriff, court system. IRS. IRS. Tell you, you've got to pay them money right now, right now, right now, or else you're going to jail. Do not fall for it. Not at all. All right, some questions here. This one's from Bill in New York. I'm planning on purchasing a new vehicle within the next two years, and I have a question. As electric vehicles increase market share, will gas prices go up as the result of supply and demand? I ask this because I typically own a car for 10 to 12 years. A quick side note, over the past two years, I have lost 70 pounds as a result of diet and exercise. My exercise routine is a daily two to three mile walk, and that includes listening to your podcast. Thank you for being a part of that journey and i want to tell you uh, it's fantastic that you have lost 70 pounds That's awesome I've, I've shared in the past that i changed my habits now um 17 years ago and i lost 50 pounds 50 yeah 50 and it was a huge health dividend losing that weight and i did it i'd always been big into exercise but I was getting bigger anyway, and it turned out calories in mount matter, and so I have watched my calories 
for the last 17 years. And I've not only lost weight, I've been able to keep it off. So congratulations on that. So the world oil market is truly that first wor word I use, worldwide. It is not a domestic U.S. market. We are now the world's largest producer of energy, but we're just one player in an international game. And oil prices are not set by country. They're set by overall worldwide price and demand plus manipulations from the OPEC cartel or OPEC plus. So uh, there's no issue specifically that would lead to higher prices for gasoline because people are in more and more countries are buying more and more electric vehicles. It could actually eventually have potentially a number of marketplace disruptions as the supply of vehicles in the world gradually migrates to electric from gas, it may lead to a reduction in exploration and production of oil. But it's going to be a very gradual thing. It's not like I dream of genie, somebody's going to go, bing, and then all the world's vehicles will be electric. It's going to be decades and decades that the world moves from a gas fleet to an electric. And so do not base your decision on what you'd buy worrying about what might happen with oil supplies or prices in a 10 to 12 year cycle. You're just fine buying whatever you prefer. I prefer electric. They're much cheaper to own and operate. So that's my thing. For you, you may want a gas engine vehicle no problem at all buying one that you would own for a 10 to 12 year cycle. Nancy in Ohio says, I recently got an email from UPS offering to ship luggage. Do you know anything about shipping luggage? It advertised that it might be cheaper than the airline fees. Have you ever done this with your all your traveling? I have a trip coming up with Frontier in December. So first of all, good luck <laughs> and my regrets to you for flying Frontier. It is a brutalizing experience to fly Frontier. I am perma-angry at their CEO who seems to be someone who is contemptuous of humanity based on the public statements he's made. And there's a class action lawsuit against Frontier now with the allegation that they have made their sizer for your personal items smaller than the actual dimensions they allow. They pay a, a uh, commission to their gate agents of $10 for every $100 fine they assess to people at the gate. And Frontier is going out of its way to make flying an even more miserable experience than it would be with Spirit or Allegiant or one of the other deep discounters. So I'm telling you, I wish you luck with Frontier. I am very disappointed in Frontier's current management. Um, as to shipping baggage, it, I have never done it because I'm a carry-on guy, but it is a common thing now. My brother, who travels uh, as a nomad with his wife and they have no home, he does this stuff repeatedly where he ships things uh, across the country as they migrate from one part of the country to another. And they've used a variety of things, including uh, UPS and FedEx and the Postal Service. I recommend that you or anyone else shipping stuff at any time, look at PirateShip.com. PirateShip.com. It will get you significant discounts on shipping packages from a variety of shippers, although their heavy concentration typically seems to be UPS. This is from Marie in Florida. I want to make a couple of improvements to my house, and I also have $25,000 in debt and credit card debt. Should I take out a home equity loan and pay off my cards and improve my house? So, Marie, I, this is something that's very popular right now for homeowners with the run-up in values. So you have credit card debt that may be at an average interest rate of 
you take out the home equity line of credit or a home equity loan, they're different. The interest rate obviously is going to be far cheaper than what your current credit card interest rate is. And you can use the money to do the improvements to your home. What's the risk? Okay, so you're taking debt that's only against your name with the credit cards and you're making it a debt against your home that if you then can't pay that home equity loan or line, you lose your home. Where right now the credit card debt has a much lower uh, consequence than what we're talking about if it is rolled into debt against your home. The second aspect that I just want you to think about, historically, people who use a home equity line or loan to pay off credit card debt end up with the same credit card balance on average, I have read, 18 months later. So you pay off the $25,000 in credit card debt by moving it to a home equity line or loan, and then 18 months later, you have the $25,000 in credit card debt again, plus the $25,000 from prior that is now against your home. So you've got to know yourself. Are you going to be able to do this transfer and not run up credit card debt again? If you in your heart of hearts can say, I promise myself I'm not going to run up that credit card debt again, then you've got uh, at least a caution light from me, if not a green light for what you want to do. If on the other hand, you can't make that statement to yourself from your heart of hearts that you won't run up the credit card debt again, then don't be tempted by the possibility of transferring that credit card debt to the home equity line or loan you'd use for home improvements. Very quickly, difference between a line and a loan. A loan is a fixed rate most popular term is five years. So you take out the home equity loan, you know what the interest rate will be and it stays that way. A home equity line is a floating interest rate where the interest rate can change every 30 days, works more like a credit card against your home instead of a traditional home loan. Coming up ahead on the issue of money, Americans are aspirational about the retirement they want to have that is very different than the amount of money they are actually saving towards that retirement. Study after study shows how unprepared so many Americans are in saving for retirement, that we're just not in a position to be able to retire based on what age we daydream and we say to researchers or pollsters, yeah, I'm going to retire at age whatever. And I talked recently about how uh, the average age that people said in survey responses that they wanted to retire was 59. And then you look at what people have saved, and it's like, that ain't happening. You're not retiring at 59. But it is possible to save money and take control. There was a um, research project that modeled how much you had to save by Pew Charitable Trust. That if over a 30-year period you were putting money in for a typical worker, you were putting in how much would you imagine per month if you did it over 30 years and invested in funds would allow you to have what's referred to as the retirement shortfall covered. How much is it? I'm glad you asked. For the typical earner, it's $140 a month. If you stay consistent doing it month after month after month, year after year after year, and you invest like in a target retirement fund, which I talk about that a lot, that you start early. I, I've told you over and over again, if you're a long-time listener to the podcast, you say, I know, I know, you're going to tell me you're the turtle. That's me. Someone wrote in and corrected that it's tortoise. I know, I know. But 
I, I just, I've always called it the turtle, okay. but that I should call it the tortoise, that I really am a tortoise, not a turtle. I think people get the idea. Steady though. and slow as you go. That's me. Slow and steady wins the race. As That's me. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I learned how slow I was when Krista and I were running a race <laughs> uh, to raise money for Habitat for Humanity in Dayton, Ohio. And we were at the University of Dayton. And... Krista stayed with me the first 30 seconds of the race. (laughs) And then next thing I know, I cannot even see her on the horizon like 90 seconds later. That was a long time ago. Yeah. But I mean, and I, and that was a long time ago and I ran that slowly. So I was a tortoise (laughs) then. I'm even slower tortoise now, but it's my mentality. Incremental improvement, incremental gain. Step by step gets it done. And for anybody who saw the movie forever ago, it was called What About Bob? Baby steps. Baby steps are the key to building long-term financial security. So this Pew Research finds using uh, computer modeling that I'm not asking you to be Daddy Warbucks and what you save a month, $140 a month. Let's divide it by weeks. And I'm and it would be $35 a week, actually a little less, because there's 4.3 weeks a month. And so then you take that by day. So we're talking about $5 a day. $5 a day is the difference for the typical income earner over your working lifetime and of course that would inflation adjust through the years but i'm keeping it simple five dollars a day going in to a retirement account would ultimately close the gap in the shortfall to get by that you would have just based on social security the people who live just on social security struggle 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 It's like, do they buy their medicine or they buy food? I mean, it's tough if you live just on Social Security. But it's not impossible to have security if you will save that money. So, of course, a lot of people listening to this podcast, you may be somebody who's like, well, I'm saving, blah, blah, blah. Great, you're fine. But I'm talking about Uh, your friend or your brother or your sister who just can't seem to get going with saving. The earlier you save, the easier it is. The more money you end up with and the financial security that you have at the end of the day is great. How do you do that? Of course you know. Roth IRA, target retirement funds, putting the money with a low-cost provider, my favorite children, Schwab, Fidelity, Vanguard. All right. This question is from Wes in California. My landlord will only accept paper checks for rent due to the fees associated with online payments. Is there any service I could use to pay her with not where neither she nor I would be charged a fee? I'm trying to minimize the dangers of say, sending paper checks in the mail. So, Wes, we've had so many questions about my landlord only wants to be paid this way. Or my landlord won't accept a check. They only will let me pay this other way. And so it's been a very interesting thing that um, so many landlords have become very rigid about how they will accept rent payments from you. The safest free way for you to do this is electronic bill pay through your financial institution. Normally, um, although there can be variation in this, Your account number will not be on there uh, with most bill pay services. The check will be free to send. It'll be free for the landlord to receive, and it will be a paper check unless it's not, it's obvious you're dealing with a small landlord. So you should be just fine doing the free electronic bill pay at where you bank or credit union. If the place you do your banking or credit union service pay, charges you for electronic bill pay, 
it's time for you to find a new financial institution. Ruth in Wisconsin says, I received a notice from TIAA that they had a security breach on May 29th. My name, social security number, gender, date of birth, and address were compromised. My first RMD is due soon. And Re- required minimum distribution, distribution, if you're not familiar with that. I'm hesitant to give them my bank account info due to this breach. What can I do? So you already know what happened, um, and it seems like it's inevitable. Somewhere, somehow, we're going to get hit with a big data breach in our lives, not caused by us, but at an institution. So the the TIAA one, I'm surprised how few people have asked me about Mm -hmm. that one because it was an ugly one. Um, They now have, once a big organization like that gets hit, they're extra secure, much better after the breach than they were before. I think it's a, a safe thing for you, relatively speaking, with the dangers in life that exist, for you to give them access to send you the the ACH for your, uh, the deposit for your uh, RMDs, and you could, if you wanted to, you could set up a separate bank account just to receive, or credit union account, just to receive those RMDs so that it won't be your main money that might be vulnerable or at risk. So that would be the alternative. And if you've not done so yet, please tell me you've frozen your credit with the three major credit bureaus because TIA has handed on a silver platter to the people who did the data breach everything they need to steal your identity completely and you can protect yourself from people applying for credit as if they're you by setting up your free credit freezes. You can see how to do it in just a few minutes at clark.com slash credit freeze. Sally in Oklahoma says you referenced using miles to upgrade a standard or business ticket to first class. We have 75,000 miles through a Capital One card. I spoke to an American Airlines rep who told me I could not upgrade to first class with Capital One points. Would I need to purchase my tickets through Capital the Capital One card and then use my points to upgrade? Because I normally book on American through my American Airlines account. I'm confused on how to go forward. So I think she means book through the portal, the Capital yeah. One portal, right? So Sally, that won't get it done for you either. When you use Capital One points through their travel portal, what happens is they take whatever the fare is and they convert it into so many uh, Capital One points. And so it's basically a penny a point in value versus the travel you're booking. The good news is with a lot of Capital One cards, you earn 2% on every charge. So you're getting double the value at the penny a point, but you're not getting the, the lower cost upgrades that I was talking about. The way that happens is if you bought a ticket on American and you used American Advantage points for an upgrade, or you bought a ticket on Delta and you used Delta SkyMiles points, or you get the idea. So they need to be points that are embedded in the airline you want to do the upgrade with. Now, with uh, many cards, you can transfer points to uh, to an airline and then do the upgrade. To my knowledge, you can't do that with Capital One. So Capital One points are really designed to be used in their system and not transferable because you can do that with your with Chase. Chase mm-hmm. And you can do that with American Express where you transfer them to a variety of partners, and sometimes it'll be a good deal to transfer, and other times it won't be. So this time, I'm afraid, I think you are going to be sitting in coach on American and not able to do a points upgrade. So I'm sorry about that, and if I fail to explain that well when I was talking about using points for upgrades, I apologize for that. I also wanted to say this, American United and Delta, with the changes they've made to their frequent flyer programs, the using points for front of the plane seats 
has become generally a really bad deal in most cases. Uh, the best deal tends to be now domestic tickets, where the irony is is that people used to work so hard to accumulate points on American, United, and Delta for travel overseas, many times front of the plane. And that's become a really, really bad deal, almost always on the big three full fare airlines. And I want to tell you, that does it for us today. Remember, what are we about here? What is this podcast devoted to? What's our website, Clark.com, about? What is Clark Deals about? It is all about you learning ways to save more, spend less, and avoid getting ripped off. And I hope you have a wonderful day.